900 horsepower, 1,000 newton meters, a fully unitary body that's 62 millimeters wider than the base vehicle, a completely new front and rear. That's the basic data for the new Brabus Rocket R, a car that not only drives amazing, but also has also been more controversial than almost any Brabus masterpiece before. The car has been tested in every possible way. What kind of car is it? How did we build it? What did we want to achieve and what's it actually about? But first, a few shots for you. Here it is, the new Brabus Rocket R. The Rocket R, a truly special car. Fantastic. I almost want to say I love it. It's such a great car. It still sounds really strange to me hearing that from you. And I still remember the first moment when we took out the final product. We were both standing downstairs in our prototype basement, and I thought, this thing is sharp as nails. Yeah. yeah, I think that's what all of us thought. It was a process, of course, but as you rightly say, when the car was finally there for the first time, painted, clean, with everything in order, just as we presented it downstairs at Brabus X. So when it stood there in our prototype workshop, it hit all of us again, and I think we all had this one-second wow feeling. Totally. A question we'll be discussing again with the Rocket R is the question as to whether this is a Brabus car. Does the Brabus brand work in combination with the base car from Zuffenhausen? Here we are, standing in front of the product two years later, and I think we both clearly know the answer. But it was definitely a journey we had to feel our way through step by step. And I gotta say, we didn't anticipate the extremely positive reaction to the Rocket R. We really weren't expecting that. No, not to that extent. We certainly didn't expect such a strong reaction. We're not that overconfident. Besides, the base car was really predestined for this. You asked the question of whether this is a Brabus, whether we can transport what Brabus stands for to this car. I think right now with this implementation, without a rear wing, with the duck tail and lots of other details, the question's been answered as clearly and extensively as it can be. This is a typical Brabus. Which brings us back to the beginning of our discussion. When I walked into the prototype room, saw the car for the first time and couldn't help thinking, Holy cow, this thing's more Brabus than any other car we've ever built. He literally said, I'll take it for a spin right now. This here is absolutely next level, and it symbolizes the Brabus brand more than I ever would have thought possible with a car like this. But enough standing around talking, let's get to it and work our way from front to back and have a look at some of its features. Let's start out with one thing, because I think it works well as a kind of index for the tech talk. What's still standard issue? That's what can be explained in the shortest and quickest way. It's the roof, it's the doors. Yeah, in this case a carbon roof instead of a sunroof? Yeah, and it's the hood. But that's all she wrote. No, everything else in this car, the exterior, the bodywork, the attachment parts, it's all new. Before we get to the front, let's talk numbers, data, and facts. The Brabus 900 Rocket R has 900 horsepower and 1,000 newton meters of torque, with a wide body that's 62 millimeters broader, which you can easily see from the front. It's clearly more stable than the base vehicle. And we also have a completely new exhaust system with 3D printed in canal tailpipes, a very tedious process. You're What's in store for us in the wheel and tire department? The tires have a 2122 combination, a 21 inch wheel diameter in the front and 22 in the back. It's a completely new wheel design, the Brabus Monoblock P, with an integrated aero disc, which is very important for the vehicle's overall aerodynamics. The chassis itself is a completely new system, our own dampers and springs with completely different spring rates. 
What's really important for me is that it's fully compatible with standard issue adjustment systems. So I still have the possibility of choosing the suspension settings to Comfort, Sport or Sport Plus through the drive selector or the corresponding button in the central console. So as you can see, we're starting to geek out. So let's go to the front. Starting with the initial designs, it was clear from the get-go that this was going to be an aggressive car. We also knew that we didn't want to just build bigger front and rear spoilers for the car. We wanted to build a coherent car, a variant unto itself, with an appearance of its own. That's right. The front is a completely new part, meaning the entire part is new, all the way down to the connector points. The part is all carbon fiber, so even the parts here that are painted in car color are made entirely of pre-preg carbon. In lots of areas here, and I'm nerding out a bit again, but we also have fiberglass areas inside where there's, for example, radar sensors. Because, as we know, carbon fiber tends to have problems with radar sensors. Right. Most of the sensors are hidden behind it, so it has to do with the material's thickness. Yes, the absorption properties. The times are over when you could simply bolt a new front spoiler or a new front apron on a car without having to deal with electronics and sensors. Those days are completely over. Carbon fibers in the mirror covers for the current G model is a great idea if you're not planning on using the navigation system. The mirror on the passenger side is precisely where the GPS antenna is. And if you cover it with carbon fiber, you're going to get into real trouble. That's why we need, as part of our rebuilding kit for vehicles with carbon fiber mirror covers, a new GPS antenna with a modified position and the wire harness and everything that entails. Here we're no longer talking about carbon fibers in the mirror, but about an entire front apron. And that's a whole other story. It's a really big and rather complex part because it consists of many parts. Along with the painted surfaces, we also have transparent coated carbon parts like the side panels, but also this very big splitter for the purpose of near field sealing, a very complex near field sealing in which air ducts go from the inside all the way to here. Another important thing here, and when we're at the rear of the vehicle with the ducktail, we'll talk at length about aerodynamics. But that topic starts here with the front splitter. It's very big and, as you see here, protrudes very far forward. I, uh, you know, it's not exactly in alignment with the license plates, but almost, and the shape really coalesces with the front of the car, which is why I find it to be just right. Of course, it's a very eye-catching part. You know how, in lots of race cars, the way the lower section of the front apron or splitter gets to be so huge that it's not only debatable as to whether it even looks good on a car that's meant for streets, but also with all the regulations we have to follow, such as pedestrian protection, crash behavior, and so on, it also gets to be very complicated. Of course, the great challenge is that the base car has active aerodynamics with an extendable front spoiler. So without that element, and also without the wing, which usually every Turbo S has, which is also vertically adjustable or adjusted, we have to compensate for all of that. We have to make sure we find a reasonable relationship, aerodynamic relationship that is, between lift on the front axle and lift on the rear axle. That's why this part is completely new. That includes the underbody paneling, from the front section to the rear wheel arches. We'll talk about that too in a minute. In this area here, with the radiator inflow and the outflow from the radiator into the wheel arches, the airflow under the splitter goes through the corresponding expansion channels and then behind into the wheel arches. The air crawls in there, I'd almost say, through something like a street map to find the right path so that we get the ideal drag coefficient. We wanted to build a car without a giant rear wing because, first of all, it made no sense to us to build a clone of the GT3 RS. And second of all, because a car like that would simply be completely out of line with Brabus. We're all about high-performance street cars. That's why one of the elements we always circled back to was the car's rear end in combination with the broader, round shape. And I know that one of the first things we laid down was that we don't want a big old clunky caboose. And then one thing leads to another, and you end up with a holistic concept because everything is interlinked.
What angle of the car do you think looks best? You know, I'm always changing my phone's home screen photo from three quarters front to three quarters back. What's so important to me about the three quarter view, which is why I'm always between three quarters front and back, is that I want to see some of the side, because I find that so much is happening on the side in this car. The shape of the fenders, the carbon fiber elements that also serve a function, with the air intakes on the back by the fenders, with these aerodynamic fins that we stuck into the upper corner of the fender. Of course, when you look at the car from this viewpoint, that's all totally visible. The body takes on a different shape, and it flows from the front through the front fender to the element directly over the rear fender, which actually starts directly at the door, onto the rear spoiler or the ducktail, all the way to the end of the car. We just talked about how we guide the air into the front of the car, how it flows out through the interior wheel arches. A really interesting effect we saw in the wind tunnel was that the air gets hotter when you do a longer run at 240 kilometers per hour. Here you could actually see with an infrared camera how, since air flows out on this side of the fender, really dynamically and energetically, this whole area turned red. You could see it really well on the infrared takes, how this area heated up because the air is brought from the wheelhouse through the radiator and the expansion channels, finally flowing out through the side of the vehicle. And we also applied this same principle to the wheels. Aerodynamics also play a big role here. We've essentially designed what I always describe as an evolution of the aerodisc that the rocket based on the GT63 has. The shape of the wheel, as you can see, has been modified quite a bit. It has a somewhat different, more open design, not just because of Porsche's central locking system, but also due to the wheel's entire geometry. Yes, it's designed more for a sports car, this lightness with fewer spokes. Yeah, but also more robust spokes. I have to say these spokes feel more robust to me than those of the Mono Z. Spatially, they can join with the rim center differently, so that here you can... I think it's really nice. I'm a huge fan of it. I love the central locking system. The middle of the central lock is nicely done. Then you have the aero discs framed again in high-quality metal elements, compensating for all the open surface. As we said, there's a design there, yes, but there's also functionality, because that's what the aero disc does. It seals off the airflow in and around the wheel, so that the ventilation on the wheel arch can work as efficiently and as problem-free as possible. Something I personally like better and think is a great evolution is that now we can see the wheel even more than was the case with the first generation aero discs. That way the wheel fits even better to the car. You've got the right elements since it's actually not just one aero disc but almost rather individual aero blades that together make up the ring. It looks better. It works. You can see the rim better. The central locking's nicely integrated. Really one of the most beautiful wheels that we've come up with in the past few years and one that clearly reflects the Brabus. DNA. Another thing you can see wonderfully here is the inner fender. Let's look at that in more detail. In that case, we'll have to turn it a bit. Let's turn the wheel inward so we can have a better look. The wheel arch lining. The inner fender. The fender's interior. We do know what we're talking about. The part that's lined with Kevlar. It's a recipe that we've used a few times before. For all kinds of cars. Yeah, on-road, off-road. We were just talking about this for the 6x6 at that incredible shoot in Fuerteventura, where we had even more wind than today. Does it look relatively decent now, or does it look completely stupid? Oh, well. But the recipe is the same here. We lined the inner fenders in Kevlar because the material offers certain advantages. Yes, it's a super robust and tough material. Of course, we also do it because of the material's exterior appearance. I think it just looks super cool. Even though, interestingly, it's the only place where you have somewhat yellowish-greenish elements on the car, which we don't have anywhere else. 
Right, that's because we process these fibers naturally. Here you see a couple of spots right around this area where the outflows for the wheel arch radiators are. The black material we have there is once again carbon fiber. So we have a mix of materials because we can do these freestanding structures better in terms of stability in carbon fiber. And this is really the raw material, you can tell it's not painted. I think these are the most elaborate and expensive inner fenders you'll find anywhere. It was an open question in engineering as we were designing it, because you can see here with the wheel just how narrow everything is. Since we went so far with the axle track, everything is really narrow here. Everything's built very much to the point, and we couldn't spare a single millimeter. Then during construction, there was the question of the inner fender's materials. Our engineer Sven just said straight up, obviously Kevlar. And that's how it should be. All right, let's continue with the side. When we both came in today, we noticed the worst kind of lighting you can throw at a car. I hate it. Beloved by everyone in development and production because you can see every little paint defect. We both took a look at the upper part of the rear fenders, or the rear part of the body here, because geometrically they're unbelievably complex parts and they're extremely hard to paint. It turned out really well with this car. And I think this whole area Rear fender, rear axle, the ducktail. To me, that's what defines the car the most. The transition to the diffuser and the rear apron. I think that's where you notice the car's unique and instantly recognizable character the most. Sure, there's the splitter at the front, the completely new front apron. We also talked about the perspectives, but still, for me, it's in the back where the car really comes to life. Yes, that's where you really get a feel for how wide it is. In fact, as we joked or, well, asserted earlier, the door is one of the few standard issue components. But we kept it very much on purpose because that's how you get the precise fit that makes the car look broader. Especially with the huge air intake in the back, which also has a specific function, to bring air to the motor through the inner wheel arches. And it really is massive. Then we have these aero fins, which mark the division between the standard issue body and the fender. And this really nicely shaped transition, also optimized with the wind tunnel, which leads back to the ducktail. The whole car has a great flow. The body parts really flow into one another, from the front, through to the doors, to the rear, and then again through the integrated rear spoiler and into the other side. It feels harmonious as a vehicle concept, and I think the risk's been worth it, saying from the very beginning that we'll be building a complete vehicle variant, and we'll be going all the way with it in regard to manufacturing its parts, especially the bodywork. What's interesting is that we said we had to try to make the shape of this whole surface as reduced as possible. So that we don't just make another wing, but still make it so that we get the aerodynamic parameters and values we're looking for. For example, if we take this carbon strip, which they also call a gurney flap, that's always an additional part attached to a wing, or in this case, to the ducktail. Of this part here, there are a total of nine variants produced that made it to the wind tunnel for comparison tests. The geometry, the shape, the radii, the height, the angle of attack of this spoiler lip, also called the gurney, it's not arbitrary. It's not just a design whim. It was driven by the results and findings we obtained in the wind tunnel. And that way, combined with the front splitter, the front and rear axle could ensure the right aerodynamic distribution and downforce. The question of a rear wing, or an integrated rear spoiler, is something of huge importance for a Porsche. Is there a clear historical inspiration for the Rocket R's rear end? Absolutely, 100%. Anybody that sees the car can see the connection to the 1974 2.7 RS, the first car that had the ducktail, the integrated spoiler on the deck lid of the 911. By the way, the car also has a second reference, not so well known, that builds on the first, which is the racing version of the 2.7 RS, a special version of the RS 2.8. It had a similar ducktail spoiler, but even more extreme. It wasn't just on the deck lid. 
It went all the way to the fender, just like ours is now. That was the RSR variant which won the Targa Florio with Herbert Müller. So it's a very special car in Porsche history. Have I mentioned that in his free time this young gentleman either works as a racing engineer or collects racing books? And I thought my hobbies were strange. But hey, every now and then he has his uses. All right now, let's get down there. The entire rear is new. The whole rear apron, the tailpipes, though we've used these tailpipes before for the Brabus A20. The exhaust system is Inconel, meaning a special nickel-enriched steel a very special material with very high solidity. And this solidity, these material qualities, allow us to use different wall thicknesses and also have a very light exhaust system. So are we actually under the weight of a normal Turbo S here? Early in development, we weighed this car and then a second car. The difference is minimal. This car is a few kilograms, around 15 kilograms under the standard weight. This is because we significantly raised the proportion of carbon parts and also made these parts weight optimized, just like the exhaust system. So yes, the weight advantage is there, but the parts we just talked about have a functional and optical purpose, a gravitational purpose. Considering the limited range we build these cars in and also the quality they should have in the end, I still find there's no other choice but high quality pre-preg carbon fiber. Yes, and besides, we have a very deep connection with the material. We have a very high manufacturing competence with it. Because we also have our own company that processes the material for us with the correspondingly sized autoclaves. There's actually no high-tech material better suited for it, and we know it extremely well. Here we are by the rear, and it's time, of course, to talk about the engine. Let me start with something that's always fascinated me about the 911. Because a 911 feels completely different as a car from an SL, an S-Class, a Maybach, or an AMG GT because you can't actually see the engine as such. We can take a look at two fans, but there's nothing more to see than that. What is it about a 911 that fascinates you? What is the fact that you can't see the motor do or not do for you? It doesn't really bother me, because this car's rear motor concept is so unique. It's the only one on the market. The Beetle used to have it. But you can see across the many development steps throughout the decades that Porsche has been developing this car, with its propulsion concept and motor position, what a high degree of evolution it's reached by now. This car's obviously not like an SL, where I can look under the hood and see the motor. You can't do that here, because the motor's deep in the bottom, hidden in this area over here. But when you put the car on a lift and look at it from below, how the whole package is, how every element is in the right place, how the airways to and from the intercooler have been designed for the air intake, that's unbelievable top-notch engineering. That made us argue quite a bit regarding the question of what can we actually do? Because you have to work with this extremely fine-tuned package, which, when you try to modify it in any way, turns around and says, no thanks, not with me, I'm not designed for that. So, getting the 900 horsepower and 1,000 newton meters out of the car was not easy, because here we're working on the premise that we build it and then we have to send it to customers all around the world. So, it obviously has to work in the place that the customer wants to use it. And of course, we offer a very high warranty for it. No, it really has to work. It has to be appropriate for everyday use. In terms of running characteristics, idle speed, etc., the car behaves like the standard version, but now it has more power. And of course, the more solid and well-developed the base is, the more robustness you'll have in the system to add on to it. As we said before, when we talked about giving this car the title of rocket, then it became clear to us. Sven Gram immediately said, then it has to have 900 horsepower. In that sense, the development goal was defined pretty quickly and easily. But the effort behind that was a lot. We worked an enormous amount with the turbochargers again. They were really the most time-consuming thing to modify. And that has to do with the fact that this car has a VTG adjustment on the turbine side. 
We also changed this VTG adjustment, we modified it geometrically, made it bigger, changed its shape. We enlarged and enormously modified the compressor unit, the unit that brings the air into the turbocharger. Then all the mounting, because, of course, more mounting pressure, more axial force on the turbo, compressors on the turbine shaft, those are all things that have to be upgraded. So the situation now is such that if you tacked on the standard issue control unit, the car wouldn't be able to drive at all because we've changed the motor sensors. Something we always come back to is the importance of electronics. We had a lot of discussions in tech talks where we said we can't do anything more because nothing works anymore without the electronics. But that's not the case. It can always become more complex. It works, but it was a lot of work. A really substantial burden that we had to drag with the motor and achieving the performance was the exhaust after treatment. With the boost pressure and pre-ignition values we're dealing with, getting to 900 horsepower with this 3.7 liter six-cylinder engine, not really a very big engine, but rather a very small, compact engine, I mean, I'd compare it with... Or going from zero to 100. Right, I mean, just compare. You usually have 400 horsepower with 4.5 liter on eight cylinders. Now we have to get that performance with a lot less displacement and two cylinders less. So exhaust after treatment was a real challenge. Would it have been easier without that? A lot easier. But it's the law. We have to follow it. Just as we've only built officially street legal cars here for the past four decades. One last thing about electronics and software, something decisive for drivability, especially considering how the car drives with a performance of 2.5 seconds from 0 to 100 and well under 8 seconds from 0 to 200, transmission and transmission control have been massively modified. The entire dual clutch transmission control, the clutch pressures, how we model the pressures, how we determine the centers of pressure, but also with regards to switching speeds, we're considerably higher than the standard issue. I mean, we're talking up to 7,200 revolutions. So a lot went into that as well, which doesn't make it go from, say, 880 to 900 horsepower. That has nothing to do with it. It's simply the drivability, so that you can feel and be able to use these 900 horsepower in the best possible way. But that's an interesting discussion there that I remember. We talked about it with the 6x6. The topic of driving characteristics in general. It's not just about about the performance and the label you get at the end. It's just as much about how a vehicle as a whole feels. And it's precisely for that that you need to look at every possible component and not just at the engine. That's real high performance. We've done the front, we've done the rear, we've done the sides, we've done the engine and transmission. Just one thing's missing. The interior. Let's hop in. At Signature Night 23, we presented two different cars. The one we're sitting in right now, the Super Black, and then, like in the last rocket releases, a gray car. Right, Signature Gray. Explain the logic behind why we do that. Well, simply because we said the main launch color is always black, since it's black and bold, Brabus design language. But we think that, especially in a car like this, where so much is happening around the exterior with the shape of the design, that it's good to have a car with a bright color, because that way you have more contours, more contrast, details. The black eats them up a bit. It's always a conversation we have. A black car like the one we're in now obviously looks super compact. As we were both coming in here, the car's rear was facing the entrance, and we both said the same thing. Man, would you look at that Batmobile. An insane first impression. Any parts that have a dark surface. Of course, in a black car, a car whose exterior is painted all black, it's super unitary. That's not the case with a brighter car, but there you can notice the parts' contours and the shape's gradients a lot better. That's why we make both. Which is your favorite, gray or black? You know, honestly, my choice would be white. White? Yes, Grand Prix white. I always thought I knew Jörn pretty well by now, but every now and then he says some things I'd never expected. It's the tradition. Porsche racing cars always used to be white or silver. 
There is a saying by Ferry Porsche, who always used to say, a racing car has to be white. Not that this is a racing car, but I think this car with its carbon parts shining in that classic Grand Prix white, that would look amazing. The problem is, I can already tell, we're going to have to build a rocket now the way you said it, in white. And I'll probably stand in front of the car and have to admit again that he was right. Well, something you're 100% right about, and I adopted your opinion 100%, is the black interior, like it is here. Because that's really unbelievably elegant and beautiful. And of course, something to point out and talk about in every tech talk, the grained leather. When I sit here and have this amazing steering wheel in my hand, I feel the leather, have the optics, the piping that's been applied everywhere. Even if it's been kept tone on tone, those are details that you see along with the carbon on the central console, the little details. And here we took the same route that we discussed with the exterior. For the interior, we went more low contrast compared to the standard version of the car with the shadow chrome parts. Absolutely. Almost all trims, as well as the handles for opening the doors or the borders of the central console, are super popular options in shadow chrome, for the inside as well as the outside. It always ensures that the parts that, for example, used to be chrome, come closer, color-wise, to the interior if it's dark. But removing or aligning colors of the interior elements to the interior's color is something we've been doing for almost 10 years now. Yes, we first made it for the S-Class Coupe with its famous shadow gold. It's not just one, but many stories where we were walking together through the shop and we'd see a masterpiece where you'd stand in front of it and say, I wouldn't have made it like that, but it looks good. Still, we won't ever get away from the color black in the future. It's what we call the color of tradition. Or, say, the cars we present at Signature Night. I always ask myself, should we do it differently sometime? And so far, we've always come to the conclusion, no, this is how it should be, since otherwise you rationalize all its recognizability away as time goes by. I have to say, this car, as you rightly said, we both came into the studio, saw the car, and both of us, even though we've seen it a million times, thought, yes, this is how it's got to be. But I still love to see one in Grand Prix white. <laughs> 2024 is coming up. Until then, guys, we're done for today. Great car, Jörn. Congratulations to engineering. And now there's just one thing left to do. You can see we're already sitting here, so now we have to go for a drive. You know I'm an incredibly bad co-pilot, but if I trust anyone as driver, it's you. We still have a date to go on. Puerto Ventura, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm waiting. <laughs> Look at that. Once again, I didn't keep my promise. We'll do that in the next video, guys. Until then. Ciao. Until then, thanks. We put a lot of work into our videos, so please don't forget to like and subscribe and become a part of the Bravos community.